Well, good morning, church. Everybody good? Y'all awake? You got your coffee? You're dry? I mean, where did that rain come from today, right? I mean, my old man fescue lawn that I reseeded over the weekend would be like, yes, you know. But uh, so glad you are here. Man, I missed you guys last week. I was at our soon-to-be Haywood campus, and I know Dallas was here. I apologize for that. Um, no, just kidding. Man, uh, I love Dallas t- to death, and um, I went back and listened. And then, of course, this morning received uh, some double-stuffed Oreos and some Starbucks gift cards. So thank you. If you gave, gave those to me, you're invited to my mansion in heaven. Um, if you didn't, um, shame on you. No, just kidding. <laughs> just joking. But uh, man, so excited to be back. Um, I know he did an incredible job. But um, a couple things before we dig into this morning's word. Just wanted to kind of reiterate and kind of on the tail end of what Corey was saying, a couple different things. Um, one, on October 9th, which is in two Sundays, we also have Baptism Sunday. I know some of you um, have shown some interest. Uh, a few of you have filled out a form. And so it's a great opportunity if you're thinking about it, if you've been discussing it um, as a family, whether it's you're an adult or a kid, uh, make sure you go online, fill out the baptism form. would love to talk to you and schedule that. And just as a church, celebrate that. I know a couple weeks ago we had seven baptisms uh, right here at Five Forks, and so we want to celebrate those decisions. Uh, That's a really, really big thing. Uh, Corey also mentioned Reset, this um, marriage series that we're doing. Uh, Me and my wife Sloan are actually leading that on Wednesday nights, and so um, our kids programming and students, uh, drop them off. There's pizza and drinks that you can pay for, cheap dinner, all right? Come on over. Um, uh, We'll be in the North Auditorium of our downtown campus and be a part of that. We're going to have some games, some giveaways, discussion. Um, I think we can all, if you are married, um, can be better spouses. And um, but they picked me and Sloan because we're perfect. Um, so <laughs> we we never fight. We have intense fellowship. That's what I call it. Uh, intense fellowship. That's like the church thing to do, right? You just add fellowship to something like men's fellowship, women's fellowship. A marital disagreement fellowship, okay? Um, but, uh, but come to that. Um, we'll start at 6.15. It'll be a great time. And just come, and, and with a biased opinion, I want Five Forks to be represented well. And so you guys come, but of course, anybody from all of our campuses are welcome. And then next Sunday is Vision Sunday, so you don't want to miss that. Um, we're going to really kind of um, talk about what God is doing in the midst of our church right now but what he's leading us to in the next season, um, in this up, upcoming year. And so be a part of that, just so you can be in the know. And if you call this place home, so you can dive in and continue to be committed that way. But I felt like after yesterday in college football, I just wanted to spend today's uh, message talking about how awesome Tennessee is. Um, Tennessee won, so I'm gonna, three points of why Tennessee is the best team in the SEC. Um, just kidding, I'm not doing that. You're like, this is sacrilegious. I'm not doing this. I hate Tennessee. That's the wrong orange, brother, all right? But um, no, it's the best orange. That's what I'm saying. But, uh, but anyway, no, I'm just joking. But a lot of my Florida fans, especially first service, they were like, if you talk about Tennessee winning, um, I'm quit this church. And I'm like, okay, live it up to the Lord, okay? Um, but no, we, uh, we, if you've been with us over the last seven weeks, Man, we have been in this series called Back to Basics, and it's been a lot. We have covered a ton of ground through this series, hitting on different theological truths that are essential to Christianity and our core beliefs, and it's a lot. There, there's no joke that I know as we're going through these, we're kind of flying by them really, really quick, and we're unpacking things. But what's an encouragement to me that as a church, I've had a lot of conversations, whether it's right after church or um, a text message or a Facebook message or, hey, can we get coffee, about how our faith has been challenged or I didn't really know that and I learned this. And, and so I'm just so thankful. That's the entire reason why we did this series because it is so important that as a believer, we know, one, what we believe and, two, why we believe it. Um, our faith, uh, the last thing that we want is for any of us that call this place home or as a believer, for our faith to be shallow, and just be like, yeah, like my kids and devotional. Like, why do you think this happened? Jesus, and that's it, all right? We need to dig deep into our faith and to understand these things. And so we've covered a lot of ground. Essentially, what we've done over the last seven weeks has been like a three to four semester seminary class, what would be called systematic theology, as we've covered a lot of different things and we just crammed it in um, using the Apostles' Creed as a framework. So we've looked at the doctrine of God. We've looked at the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Last week, the doctrine of the church. And so this, this morning, as we conclude this series, really it's more of the same. 
And I would even say that as, I'm just speaking personally, as I've wrestled with this message for a good two weeks now, you, you will probably walk away maybe with more questions than answers. And let me just kind of rest, uh, rest, rest you assure of this, that that's okay. It's okay not to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. You'll be like, well, you paid a lot of money for seminary. I still don't know anything, okay? And so we, we're gonna walk through this together and um, kind of go through this. And I'm more than um, happy to meet up during the week and kind of talk through these things about what I'm learning, but I'm still learning these things. And so just be okay with that, all right? Um, but Paul, in um, the letter to the Philippian church, he writes this verse. You probably have heard this verse. This is not where we're landing this morning, but in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says this. He says, I'm sure of this, or your translation might say, I'm confident, but Paul says, I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will see it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. All right, so he says, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, talking about God, that how God created or began a good work in you, that it will be completed or he will see it in completion in the day of Jesus Christ. So let's unpack that just for a second because I think it's gonna help the wheels turn to where we're going this morning. And I'm just throwing it out there. It's gonna be a hard concept to grasp. But what we see Paul say is he who began a good work, talking about God, really the work that he began, was, it starts with salvation. That's the work that begins. That in our hearts, that we come to a point of surrender. We come to a point where we notice that we can't do life by ourselves. There's no way we can earn our, um, uh, our salvation and spend eternity um, in heaven just based on our works. And so that we need Jesus as, uh, to pay the price of our sin. And so God starts this work in us. It's called justification. That in that, that's the beginning of the work. But then Paul says that, um, that he will complete it in the day of Jesus, when Jesus returns. So in the second coming, when Jesus returns, and we believe as Christians that one day Jesus will return, we don't know when that is. If anybody comes to you and says, hey, it's gonna be October 1st, you can just say, you have my permission. You're a liar, okay? Um, because we don't know the day and the time. But when Jesus returns, that then that work that, G, that God um, began in us will be completed. You following me so far? So it comes full circle. But in that, what we see is these two final lines of the Apostles' Creed that say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Now, the life everlasting, eternal life, okay, for most of us, if you grew up in church, you're like, okay, there's a heaven and a hell. When we die, we're going to one of those places. But the resurrected body is really a concept that just seems really odd. And to be quite frank, like at, at face value, it seems a little bit like a Walking Dead episode series, right? That it's kind of like, what does that mean? And if you remember a few weeks back when we looked at the resurrection of Jesus, we looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that's where we're going to be this morning. Um, so you can go ahead and turn there. But just to kind of recap... Paul is answering the questions of the um, Corinthian church. They're kind of talking about this, and he's reassuring them of the resurrection of Christ. So he says this. He says, hey, Jesus rose from the grave. He conquered death. And he really kind of says this. He says, I know it's true, one, because what happened is exactly what Scripture said. And when he's talking about Scripture at the time, is Old Testament prophecy that what, what was said then hundreds, thousands of years ago actually came true. But then he says, not only that, but then Jesus showed up to Cephas and to the disciples and then to, then to 500 people. And I love this. Paul says, then he showed up to me. And so it's personal for him. And so he's proving evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. And what we're going to see this morning is that Paul then kind of shifts in the later part of chapter 15 and he connects what happened to Jesus being resurrected to our one day being resurrected. You following me so far? I know it's kind of weird, but we're going to get into this this morning. But I really do think these two lines, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, life everlasting it really provides us, if you are a believer, with hope and courage. It should give us knowing that one day 
Jesus will return and we will be with him forever, life everlasting. That should give us great hope. Not the kind of hope that we're like, I hope I get a new car, or I hope I get this job, or I hope I get a raise, or anything like that. It is a, a greater hope, an ultimate hope, that we say, you know what, it doesn't matter about all these other things. The one thing I can be confident of and assured of is my salvation, and that I'm gonna spend eternity with Jesus. And so this, this whole idea, what we're gonna look at, really brings that home. And so let's read, let's dig in. It's a lot of scripture, and I know it's okay. Some of this is a mystery. Paul even calls it a mystery. It's gonna be a lot, and so we'll, we'll kind of chunk off some and kind of walk through it and explain it. And like I said, you might, might, might have more questions than answers, and that's okay. But let's start chapter 15, verse 35. Paul says this, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? So Paul's about to answer this question. And he kind of asked this rhetorical question, even though he's going to answer it, because of the day, the religious kind of climate of the day, you have to think the Corinth church is heavily influenced by Greek culture. And so you have philosophers like Plato and um, Socrates that really have instilled like, hey, there is an afterlife. They haven't really defined it. But they would say, when you die, your body's in the ground and your soul or your spirit goes to heaven, enough said. There will never be a day or it seems impossible in their philosophies for the body to be resurrected. It's decaying. How could that happen? And so Paul says, let me answer this. I'm, and so he says, someone will ask because he knows they're asking this. How are the dead raised and what kind of body do they come? He says, you foolish person. He says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. So he goes into this analogy. Paul kind of picks up what Jesus does and using these stories as illustrations to prove a point. He says, but God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. There's one kind of humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. He said there's all kinds of different types of bodies. He says there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory um, of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, that's Jesus, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. Y'all okay so far? All right, I know it's a lot. Thus it's written, okay, all that stuff, but it is not spiritual, the first, okay. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So essentially what Paul is saying is our flesh, okay, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the points, our flesh is that of men, right? That we have human flesh, there's all kinds of different flesh, but one day we will take on uh, a different image, the image of the man of heaven. That yes, while we are created in the image of God, the Imago Dei, that sin disrupts, corrupts, disowns, empowers, brings weakness, all of these different things. But one day we will be renewed in the image of God. Okay, let's continue. We have eight more verses, all right? So hold on. I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
Behold, I tell you a mystery. And we're like, yes, it is a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. I said immorality the first service. Isn't that fun? All right. You're probably thinking it too. I know. All right. Uh, immortality. And then when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on uh, immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Here's the power of it all. Paul quotes Isaiah 25. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, or, or where's your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord, who? Jesus Christ. The victory comes through Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. All right, so here's how we're gonna tackle this because I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. It's like drinking out of a fire hydrant with your hair on fire, right? Is that we're gonna try to do this the best way, kind of answer some questions, all right? So there's three questions and I'll, I'll break these down. I'm gonna go through them really fast right now. We're gonna answer, are the dead raised? All right, how will the dead be raised? And when will the dead be raised? All right, so we're gonna talk through that. But let's, let's land and kind of start this journey on are the dead raised? What we see throughout scripture, it is our Christian belief, what Jesus taught, that there will one day be a day where Jesus returns and all bodies will be resurrected. The dead will be raised. So to answer the question, are the dead raised? Yes, okay? Simply put, the dead will be raised. Now this will be when Jesus returns to the earth we believe, we see in Scripture, especially in Revelation, that Jesus will return. And when he returns, the currently living people who are believers will gather with other believers to, that are in heaven. And people who are dead essentially will be raised. And this is what will happen. Their spirit that's in heaven will reconnect with their earthly bodies. All right, I know this is getting weird, right? And the same will be true for both believers and and unbelievers. Now the outcome of what takes place at that coming of Jesus is different. And so we'll talk about this in the second point, but for the believer, as our body is made new, as we're re resurrected and our spirit then reconnects with our body, um, we will then live with Jesus everlasting life, okay? Eternal life. But for the unbeliever, they will be what's called in scripture, the, they will see and experience a second death, meaning that they will now be with their, their bodies will be raised, their spirits from, from hell will then be re reconnected with their bodies, and then they will be judged again and sent to hell. Now, a couple different thoughts, I'm just throwing this out there that are not biblical. There's some understandings that people kind of approach this subject with. One is the view of what's called annihilation. The view of annihilation would say that because of Jesus' love and God's grace, and he's a loving God, and he wouldn't send anybody to hell. He just wouldn't do it. And so essentially what would happen at this time is as the dead uh, unbelievers are raised and reconnected, instead of sending them to hell and have torment all over again because of his grace, he would just kill them all and put them out of their misery. That's annihilation. Doesn't that seem encouraging? All right. Um, and so that is not biblical. The second view that kind of goes in line with this is the universal, uh, universalistic view or univer universalism, can't speak this morning, that says because of God's love and his compassion, that it would be a second chance that he would raise the dead, bring their souls out of hell and say, I don't want anybody to be in torment. I don't want you to go to hell. So guess what? Congratulations, you've been rewarded a second chance. So you're gonna live on, you've been forgiven, everybody's saved. Not in scripture. We see that God is a God who is a fair judge 
and a just judge. And so there are consequences to not giving our life to him, not surrendering, not to say we're perfect, we can't do anything to earn it, but to surrender our life to him. And so there will be a time. We see in, um, in Acts chapter 24, it says there will be a resurrection of both the just, righteous, and the unjust. But the difference is the outcome of that. And so will the dead be raised? Yes. I think one of the biggest questions that, that people think of in the, on this earth is what happens when you die? And I think it's easy for us to think, well, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't been in jail. I'm good to go. Uh, I'm going to heaven. But what we see in Scripture is our sin demands a payment of death to hell. And without Jesus, that's where we're going. So when we die, obviously, what we see in Scripture is that our body um, we're abs is absent, but we are present with the Lord. And so when we die, our body is put into the ground, or maybe you're cremated, or whatever the case, and your spirit goes. But when Jesus returns... He will come, our earthly bodies will be resurrected, reconnected with our souls, and then we are made new. Are you following me so far? Is that good? All right. Second point, how will the dead be raised? Paul, in this passage, and I love this because I'm a dummy and I need illustrations like this, uses the idea, this illustration of a seed or a grain. And he pretty much says that if you take this grain of wheat or a bare kernel, if I was to take a kernel of corn, all right, and I go to my house and I put it in a potted plant and I grow it, what, comes, what is produced is not just a grain of corn, right? It's like a beautiful stock, right? I don't know if that's beautiful. I don't know. But it's one of those things that you see this incredible plant. And so what Paul is saying is, okay, that little kernel, it dies but it comes to life and what it creates is something more beautiful than what it originally started with. And the same is true, true of our lives. I think about this a few years ago. I don't remember what grade he was in. Our youngest, Noah, um, was probably second or third grade. And I think if you have a kid in elementary school or have been there, done that, you know this. He did like the whole lima bean and, and plant uh, or in soil and planted it. You know what I'm talking about? And they put it in the window and you see it plant or whatever. And Noah was so excited that this little lima bean turned into a plant. He came home, was so ex excited about it. His face was on it. So much so, his science teacher or the STEM lab teacher called and said, Noah's plant was the tallest of all the lima bean plants. And then Noah says it was so tall, he named his lima bean plant LeBron James. Okay. <laughs> He named it LeBron James. I don't know, whatever, because it was the tallest there. And we kept it. He was like, well, it's got to grow. And he was like, man, we got to put it somewhere in the yard. I'm like, no, we don't, okay? Um, and so we put it on our windowsill. And that thing, I'm not joking. It was like this tall, okay? But it had like all these leaves. And he was like, oh, look at it. It's so, it's so cool. And then finally we got rid of it. We threw it in the trash because LeBron James is trash. And um, <laughs> y'all will get that later. Did it? Shh, all right, never mind. Y'all are like, no, he's good, man. Michael Jordan's a goat. Okay, so, uh, uh, but anyway, what Paul is saying is you take that little grain, you take that kernel, and you plant it, and it dies, but what it produces is so beautiful. And essentially, our bodies, when we are raised from the dead, we take on the image of God, we take on the image of Jesus. And so I don't know about you, I turned 40 this past summer and I'm looking forward to the day where I have a new regenerated body that doesn't snap, crackle and pop when you wake up, you know? You're like literally last week I got out of my car and hurt my back by getting out of my car, you know? And so for us to think about a day that Jesus um, and through the grace of God resurrects our body and makes it new. This isn't reconstruction. This isn't resuscitation. This isn't like, oh, your body's decaying. That'd be weird walking dead type thing. It's made new. And that, that way, even some, there's some scriptures that say that we will have a, a brilliance or a glow about us, right? It's kind of hard on a Sunday morning to have that glow, but that we will have that brilliance, that radiance, that shows the work of Jesus in us as being fully redeemed. And this is the completion of the work that Jesus begins. Think about this. At the beginning, it's justification of our lives. When we give our life to Jesus, the process of us in and through life becoming more like Jesus is sanctification. 
And then what we get at this moment is what is known as glorification. That our bodies have been resurrected, united with our souls, and been made new, fully redeemed. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. The resurrected body completes the work of God's redemption. It completes it. It is when Paul is referring to the, in the church of Philippi to say, hey, to the end of the day of Jesus, that's when it will be completed. This is what happens. Our bodies are now finally completed to live on new earth with new heaven and everything fully restored, fully redeemed um, in this. This is why Paul goes back and forth. And I love this. He, he uses this sowing and reaping. He says, we're sown perishable, we're, but then we're raised imperishable. We're sown in dishonor, but we're raised in glory. We're sown, we're buried in weakness, we're raised in power. We're sown earthly, we're raised heavenly. We're sown um, uh, mortal, we are raised immortal. Think about the power that this shows that, that really the work of God in our lives in the final days to say, hey, you can be buried that way, but I'm here to resurrect a new body and to complete my redemption story in you and through you. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And then third, what we see is when will the dead be raised? We've kind of already answered this, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, it says this, you can follow along on the screens. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord, life everlasting. I think sometimes we kind of sell ourselves short thinking eternal life is just I die and I go to heaven. That is true. But there will also be a day when Jesus returns and takes our spiritual souls, connects them with our body, and now we really live in eternity with new heaven and new earth, all made new. But here's why all of this matters. And Paul alludes to this in the very last verse. He says this in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So why do we hope? Because we know that Jesus has conquered death. Where, where is the victory? It's in God. Where is the sting? It's in God. It's not for us because Jesus has conquered that. God has made us new, will one day make us new in our resurrected bodies. And, and what Paul is saying is be steadfast, fast. Do not quit. Keep it up. Keep working. I, a couple weeks ago, some of y'all know this, I'm just being really transparent. So my dad, he lives by himself up in Virginia and is going through some medical stuff. And to be quite honest, me and him have an estranged relationship. So don't, we don't really keep up, but he has kind of entered into a process, what I believe is some dementia stuff going on and some health issues where he's not able to really take care of himself. And, and so we're trying to get him to go to the doctor and do some different things. And he's just being stubborn and not wanting to do that. But my dad is not a believer. And I'll, I'll be really transparent. There have been different areas of my life where I have honestly said, there's no way my dad will ever become a believer. It's just pointless. But I'm gonna tell you, just a couple weeks ago, my dad made a comment, I was on the phone with him, made a comment about, he said something, I'm just ready to go home. And I said, okay, what do you mean by home? He's 72 years old. And he goes, in heaven, or at least I hope I get there. Well, that opened up a door for me to present the gospel, full gospel to my dad for the very first time. And, I, and you know what? He didn't start crying and give his life to Jesus or anything like that in that moment. But it reminded me that the reason as believers that you and I, even in the midst of our doubts and failures and hardships, it reminded me that the Lord's work is never in vain. And Paul is reminding that even though it might not make sense, that our work is not in vain because it's the Lord's work. And as we're walking with the Lord, 
And as we're interacting with our neighbors and our coworkers and our friends and our kids' friends and everybody else that we encounter, you and I have the opportunity to show them Jesus. And I pray that one day when Jesus does return, those people that were like, they need Jesus, they would come to know Jesus and that you would give it to them. That you would be the church and help them see their need for him, that you would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your work, your labor is not in vain. Church, we got a lot of work. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's get to work. Let's see lives radically changed. That's our hope. And I don't know where you're at in your walk with God this morning, and you might be like, this is weird. (laughs) Dustin, I just don't know. But let me say this in closing. And let this kind of sit in if you're closing and just in your notes. Our future resurrection offers hope to our faith now and completion of our faith in the future. It provides us hope right now, no matter what you're going through, it provides us hope. But it also completes our faith, what we believe and what we follow right now in a future day. Let's pray together. Father, so often we come across passages that are just hard to wrap our brains around. And I'm thankful as a church that we tackle those things, not just skirt around them because they are truth. And today, just quite frankly, it's, it's hard to really understand what you're saying, but what we know is true is that one day you will return and that one day you will give us new bodies, bodies that haven't failed us, bodies that aren't frail, but are redeemed and resurrected in the likeness of your son, Jesus. And Father, that's an incredible hope. But it all starts with knowing you. So for the person that's here this morning that doesn't have a relationship with you, Father, I pray that they would talk to me either during the song or after service. The person that's just struggling with their faith, maybe they wanna come down front and just pray either with me or just on the front of the stage, just use it as an altar to give you everything. But Father, we know that we can have a resurrected body one day because of the blood that was shed through your son, Jesus. And that as he conquered death, he gave us life. And so let us choose that today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's close in worship. If you'd like to talk or pray, I'll be down front as always.